So this is the, the first time our Business Advocacy Council has officially gotten together in, a, in quite a while on a consistent basis. We've had some side meetings uh, about some different things going on, but we haven't really had our group discussions back together. So I appreciate y'all coming back together. We also changed the time of the meetings. They're now gonna be on the fourth Friday of the month at 8.30 via Zoom until we can get back together again. Um, but we're also do like we were doing before and having some speakers come through to talk with us and kind of give us some perspectives. And Tracy and I were on a call um, with the Charlotte Regional Business Alliance a few weeks ago and Catherine Lowhead spoke and um, was talking about it was a joint meeting between North and South Carolina chambers. So she was talking about the North and South Carolina tax taxes and how we kind of rate with others um, in our area and in, and in the United States as well. Um, and it, it was just a really well, well done presentation, gave a lot of good perspective. So Trace really thought you guys would do a presentation as well, but we would just keep it on the topic to North Carolina versus, you know, including South Carolina. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Catherine and make sure she can share the screen. Let me uh, do that really quick again, since we came on and came up again. And um, I am outside at a coffee shop. So I apologize for the, if it looks a little different, but uh, Catherine, uh, let me know if you're okay to share that screen. All right. And I will hit. And I think while you're doing that, maybe we'll go around and let everybody introduce themselves since we have a small group today. So you know who you're, who's on the call. Um, I'll just start with Mike. He's um, Mike, go ahead and introduce yourself and we'll pass Mike it to Beth, Beth after. The Director of Government Affairs for Charter, also known as Spectrum. Uh, I cover basically the Western third of North Carolina and I'm based in Charlotte. Jim? Beth, and then we'll toss it to. Yeah, I, I, I'm Jim Tarman. I uh, am retired, but from AT and T, external affairs with them. And I'm Beth Packman. I am president of an organization here in Iredell County called Our Schools First. We're a pro public education advocacy group that's nonpartisan. Um, we find that here in North Carolina, one of the other pressing issues is making sure we have good public education. Um, so that's who I am. Brian. Hi, good morning. I'm Brian Duncan. I um, am executive director of iCare Incorporated, a local nonprofit agency that works with um, low income families. And I am currently the chair of the chamber board. Tracy? I'm Tracy Gibson. I'm co-owner of Homestead Senior Care, my husband Creighton, and um, um, VP of Public Governmental Affairs um, with the Chamber of Commerce. And at your last presentation, when we were talking about getting rid of some taxes possibly and replacing them with others, that the rations that they were happening, especially in the service industry, I really thought would benefit our community um, with the amount of services that we have. Okay, thank you. All right, I think that, did I cover everyone? I'm sorry, I can't tell. Yeah, did I miss anybody? If, all right, well, I'm gonna let, go ahead and let Catherine uh, take it away, Catherine. Well, great, well, thank you so much. It's nice to meet you all and really appreciate the chance to be with you today. Um, so I'm with the Tax Foundation. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan tax policy research organization based in Washington, D.C. And we work on state tax policy issues at the state, federal, and actually recently international levels. And so really our goal at the state level is to make sure that regardless of how much revenue a state states and local governments raise to fund their government services. Our goal at the Tax Foundation is to make sure that they are able to do it in a way that 
avoids negatively impacting economic growth in the state and that doesn't penalize job growth and wage growth and things like that. And so we've actually worked extensively in North Carolina over the past decade. And so we are really personally invested in wanting to make sure that the state continues to be a leader when it comes to good tax policy. Uh, you've made some of the most notable tax reforms um, that any state has done in recent history. And so that's really something to be proud of and something we wanna to continue to work with state leaders to build upon. And so I'll spend like 20 minutes or so kind of walking through where North Carolina stands in terms of tax competitiveness. And then I'll look at a couple issues that could be reformed um, in the future. And then I also wanna spend a few minutes specifically on transportation funding and the gas tax issue, because uh, I know that is of a lot of interest to business leaders in your state. Um, and then feel free to interject with any questions. Otherwise, I'm definitely happy to open it up for questions at the end. Um, so I kind of just want to start by saying that um, this is, of course, a very economically challenging time for everyone, for families, businesses, state and local governments. We're all experiencing the effects of COVID-19 and that creates a lot of uncertainty, of course, for state policy making. And so it's difficult to make good policy decisions when we don't know exactly what the next few months will hold. Um, and that's just one of the challenges we all are facing right now. But one thing I do wanna emphasize is that at all levels of government, it's really important for policy leaders to be considering how to enhance business liquidity at a time like this, because the focus should really be on helping job creators, helping businesses survive this crisis so that they're able to go back to rehiring employees they might have laid off and go back to making a profit if they're currently losing money. Um, things like that. And so at the federal level, back in March, the CARES Act was, of course, enacted. And in addition to the PPP loans and the economic impact payments and things like that, one of the really kind of great things it did, but the lesser understood things it did, is it created some good tax policy changes at the federal level. Now, these are temporary. Most of them last only a couple years. Um, but they are structurally sound in that they are taking good things about the tax code and kind of making them even better to enhance business liquidity. So things like offering net operating loss carrybacks or offering more generous carry forwards or improving the treatment of business investment, things like that. Now at the state level, states of course have less flexibility to do things like that um, because states aren't able to deficit, deficit spend like the federal government can. And um, there's just, a, there's a lot of balanced budget requirements in almost every state. And so it's a little more challenging for states, but right now North Carolina status is, a bill was signed into law um, June 30th that updates the state's conformity with the federal tax code and it decoupled from a lot of the CARES Act cha tax changes. Um, but so it conformed to some of them, some of the individual provisions. So some of those same things will be offered at the state level, but it did, did decouple from some of the most notable liquidity enhancing ones. So things like the net operating loss changes and interest deductibility changes that are offered at the federal code will not be offered at the state level. So just something to be aware of that if a business is getting all these great benefits from the federal tax code right now, they aren't necessarily getting them in North Carolina. But in general, North Carolina is in a very good position going into this crisis because of the good tax policy changes you have made over the past eight years. And so I really think that businesses, um, or I'm sorry, states like North Carolina that went into this crisis well and in a good position are going to recover faster. Um, and businesses will be more likely to be able to bounce back a little faster than in other states where um, already we're seeing so many tax increases being proposed. Just overnight, um, I heard that North New Jersey um, has sent a bill to the governor that would impose much higher taxes on people um, and businesses, pass through businesses, and those toward the higher income levels. Um, lots of wealth taxes being proposed. 
in states like California and higher income tax rates in states like New York and possibly Illinois. So North Carolina is in a different position than states like that, thankfully. But I do think over the next few years, there will be pressure, um, probably more pressure than any time that's been experienced over the past decade to kind of roll back some of the good reforms that have been made. So it's just something to be aware of how those good reforms are helping businesses right now. The lower corporate income tax rate, the lower individual income tax rate is helping families and pass-throughs. So those are good policy decisions that make North Carolina stand out and they should be preserved as much as possible. And so I wanna briefly just talk about where North Carolina stands compared to the rest of the country in how its tax code is structured. So some of you, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but the Tax Foundation has a state business tax climate index. It's a report we publish annually. We've published for over 17 years now that uses over 120 different policy variables and compares states according to their tax structure. And so it's kind of a diagnostic tool to show how well or how poorly a state's tax code is structured. And it's more based on structure than it is based on rates. So states that have simpler, more stable, neutral, transparent tax codes are going to do really well on our index. And states that have really burdensome, complex tax codes are going to do poorly on our index. And so North Carolina used to have one of the worst structured tax codes on our index. Um, before the reforms that were made over the last decade, North Carolina was ranked only 44th out of the 50 states. But the reforms have really brought the state up to one of the most competitive states. So currently, North Carolina is 15th out of the 50 states. Um, and it, that's especially impressive because most of the states in the top 10 are states that completely forgo one of the major taxes. So they might not levy an individual corporate income tax or a sales tax. But North Carolina is one of the states that does levy all the major taxes, but still performs really well. So you're consistently ranking up there with, with uh, Utah, Indiana, as some of the most competitive. Um, so before the 2013 reforms, North Carolina had a high individual income tax rate with a top rate of 7.75%, a high corporate income tax rate of 6.9%, now that flat individual income tax rate is 5.25%. And of all the states with a corporate income tax, you have the lowest rate at only 2.5%. So these are really good reforms that are making the state really attractive to entrepreneurs and pass through business owners and families. And you more than me can say that. You can vouch for the people that want to move to North Carolina and their interest that has been um, generated in the state, but I think we see, um, looking at the migration data, we see a lot of people moving to North Carolina from states like Illinois and some of those other high tax states um, in the Midwest and the West Coast, East Coast, people I think more and more are going to be wanting to flock to the Carolinas um, for the tax code, for plenty of other things, but for the good business environment. And that will only help the state grow more and more in the future. So here's kind of what I just went over a little bit more, but you can see on our index, the states in blue are the top 10. So the states you really wanna keep competing with moving forward. So Indiana, Utah, Florida, a lot of those states don't levy one of the major taxes. And then on the left side of the screen, you can see kind of where you stand on each of the subcomponents of the state business tax climate index. So one of the most competitive corporate income tax rates, really doing pretty well in the top 10 on unemployment insurance taxes, which of course matter a lot to businesses. Um, above average on individual income tax structure, above average on sales tax structure. Some property tax improvements could be made, but overall, a 15th ranking overall is really is really good and something to be proud of. So it, maybe some of you have seen this. It's actually a tax reform options guide our organization wrote back in 2013, right before the reforms that were made um, with the Carolina Business Coalition. And we identified a lot of areas of the tax code we wanted to see improved. And so a lot of those areas were improved as part of the reforms that started in 2013. But one of the big things we recommended that has not yet been prioritized is 
continuing to look at the franchise tax and that how that is harmful to the business environment in North Carolina. And then also continuing to modernize the sales tax base because that's something that has been started, but has been pretty modest. And so there's definitely lots of room for improvement there. So starting with the franchise tax, um, if you're not super familiar with that structure, basically it's um, levied on, it's franchise tax or capital stock tax. So it's levied on either a company's net worth in the state or accumulated or accumulated assets in the state of North Carolina. And so in North Carolina, state companies are subject to either, or I'm sorry, to both the corporate income tax and the franchise tax. And so if you're a C Corp, you're paying bo both. If you're an S Corp, you do have to pay the franchise tax and of course, individual income taxes as well. But companies are paying both. And so in a lot of the states that do have a franchise tax, they might make businesses pay one or the other, the corporate income tax or the franchise tax, but North Carolina is making businesses pay both. And so that does negate some of the benefit that the state offers by having one of the lowest and most competitive, or I'm sorry, the lowest corporate income tax rate. So it's really something we'd like to see prioritized for reform, and especially just because of the way it's structured, because it is one of the more economically harmful taxes when you think about the way that it's levied on a base of net worth or based on tangible property and assets in the state, capital in the state. And so really it creates a disincentive to have capital in North Carolina. And especially right now, when you think about all the capital intensive industries that have been really hurting, so manufacturers who may even be losing money right now. Some businesses who aren't making a profit, they are really struggling to even survive. And so they will be um, paying those franchise taxes, even if they're not making a profit this year. And they'll be paying those taxes based on their capital and assets in North Carolina, even for periods, maybe there was a month or two where they had to shut down or really um, curtail their operations and they're still being taxed on that capital even if it was kind of sitting there not doing much for a month or two so it's especially harmful during this time but even when we're not in a recession it does create an incentive toward profit taking over investing in the business in north carolina investing reinvesting back in the state and so a lot of um businesses will be paying those burdens this year and it'll be pretty harmful even if they're not making as much income so they're paying a lower corporate income tax than they might otherwise. So in a typical year, um, of course, the corporate income tax is really volatile as a res revenue source as we will see during this recession. But in a typical year, the franchise tax brings in about 90% as much as the corporate income tax. So it's still a pretty big source of revenue and Phasing it out isn't something that will happen overnight, but it is something that should be prioritized. Um, currently, you can see there are 16 states that continue to levy a franchise tax, but states even like Illinois and New York, high tax states are phasing theirs out. Mississippi is phasing its out, and even high, high tax Connecticut is going to start phasing its out next year. So it's something we think is doable in North Carolina. Um, interestingly, last year, the legislature did pass a bill to reduce the franchise tax rate that was vetoed by the governor. Um, so it's unclear exactly where those efforts will stand moving forward, but there has been some interest in looking at that and trying to reduce that tax moving forward. And so, Catherine, oh, I'm, can I ask a quick question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my husband is a dentist and we pay all of a whopping $50 a year for franchise tax. Okay. So when you compared this, did you happen to look at the total overall revenue expenditure of both corporate taxes and franchise tax in comparison to other states? I mean, because if our corporate tax rate is so low and our and we're still charging a franchise rate, are we still pretty equal to everybody else? Does that make sense? Sure, that's a good question. I did not compare how much revenue overall you raised from right. the franchise tax compared to other states. Um, that would be something interesting to look into. Yeah. Um, I'd be happy to try to find some information on that and see. 
I know you do, because you have a lower corporate income tax rate right. than every other state, you do um, generate, you know, you rely less on the corporate income tax than most states. And so I think it's only $670 million in franchise tax revenue that the state brought in. Um, I think that was FY17 that I looked at. So it's about 1.4% of the state's total revenues in a given year. Um, so if that gives you some idea of how much you bring in, but of course, like you mentioned, some businesses won't pay very much, but if you're right. a really capital intensive business, you could be paying thousands, hundreds of thousands. And one thing about North Carolina's franchise tax is that there's no cap, there's no maximum on how much you might pay in a given year. And so a lot of states that do have a capital stock tax limit it, they put a cap on it. Um, so that's one option to consider moving forward and also, or reducing the rate, a couple of different approaches there. Does that kind of get at your question a bit? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Are there any other questions so far? Yeah, uh, it's what a dollar fifty per thousand in assets. Is that right? The French I, assets. I believe so. Yeah. Well, um, t Tennessee has no personal income tax. Do they have a corporate income tax? Tennessee, I believe, does. Yes. Yeah, they do have a corporate income tax, but they will be moving away from there. They have the hall tax on investment income and that's been phasing out and i think as of january 1st it will be completely gone but i do believe they still levy a corporate income tax okay thank you of course so the next thing i just want to talk about is continued sales tax based modernization um in a lot of states the sales tax is applied pretty haphazardly where it applies to most goods. Of course, there are some major exceptions, um, but most consumer services are still exempt. And this is really mostly due to historic accident because sales taxes were first adopted right around the Great Recession when the economy was, of course, much more goods-based than it is now. But the sales tax still looks that way. And a lot of states haven't really done major reforms on that. And so it is something we would like to see states continue to prioritize in order to just create a more neutral and um, a more neutral tax code, but also that will generate state and local revenue um, that can be used to reduce some of the more harmful income or franchise tax rates. So um, over the last, eight years, North Carolina has brought in the sales tax base a bit, as I'm sure you're all familiar. Um, so things like, normally it was, a, some of the things it was expanded to were services if they are bundled with a good. So if you are getting your car repaired and you're paying sales tax on the appliance, um, you're paying sales tax on that, but now you're also paying sales tax on the, on the labor services. And same with some home services, things like that. So a lot of repair services, installation is now subject to the sales tax. And it could be broadened even further to things like haircuts, those are not subject to the sales tax right now, nail salons, health clubs, pet grooming, landscaping, things like that aren't subject to the sales tax and really should be. Now I know that's a politically difficult thing to do, it is challenging, but I think um, once the state is able to do even more of that, that would free up a lot of revenue that could be used for more competitive rates on businesses. Because one way or another, taxes are being transferred to individuals, whether it's kind of hidden in the corporate income tax and people don't always see that it's impacting labor and wages or you know, in other or individual income taxes where it's a little more transparent than that. But individuals are paying the taxes. And so it makes sense to do it in a less economically distortive way like the sales tax. So something to consider moving forward. And then I'll shift now to talking for a few minutes just about transportation taxes. Um, because I know this is of interest to a lot of businesses in every state really, not just North Carolina. Um, kind of 
how can we improve our infrastructure to um, make b doing business easier in the years and decades ahead? And it's really something every state will have to look at and the federal government will have to look at because as you can see, um, gas tax revenue is projected to continue to decline a lot over the decades ahead as it already has been with technical technological improvements as vehicles become more fuel efficient and we're not fueling up as often um, as electric vehicles continue to grow slowly but surely as a share of the overall vehicle market. And then another thing is just that the federal gas tax isn't indexed for inflation. So it has lost a lot of its real buying power over time. And in North Carolina, it was not indexed for a while. Now it is. Over as of just a couple of years ago, it is now indexed for inflation. So that will help revenue keep better pace with the real costs of infrastructure spending in the years ahead. But still, because of other factors, it will continue to remain on a downward trajectory. And also now we, of course, have a pandemic where a lot of us right now are working from home. We're not going into the offices often. And I think we're going to see a lot of businesses. I mean, you can tell me what you're hearing, but I know a lot of companies, my employer, are all looking at expanding telework more permanently. And so I don't think we can expect gas tax revenue to just bounce back to where it was even when the coronavirus does abate. So I think this will be more and more of a problem moving forward. And so a couple solutions to that. Um, my, so in the long term, it might make sense to start looking at other revenue sources. And my colleague Ulrich Boson has actually written a paper. Um, I can share it with you after, but it's on um, kind of long-term infrastructure funding considerations, specifically looking at a vehicle miles travel tax. And there's that would be a really good um, approach from a tax policy perspective because it would um, really associate um, vehicle mileage with, so those who are paying, using the roads the most would be the ones who are paying for road upkeep the most. So it would be a good user fees model model. Um, of course, there are some major privacy, privacy issues with tracking vehicle mileage. And so it remains to be seen whether those will be able to be addressed in some way. So I encourage you to look at his paper if you want to kind of learn more about the minutia and all the details that are involved there. So that's still yeah. your uh, On that question, yeah. how do you track various counties by county versus track state by state if they're in different states? travel in different states? See, that's, that's a really good question. And that would become kind of an issue. There would be ways to potentially minimize the privacy issues um, if you track just when someone enters and leaves your state. But then if you're only, like you said, it gets to be a problem county by county. So, and I, I'm not an expert on VMTs at all. I'm still trying to learn the ins and outs. So I would maybe consult Ulrich a little bit about some of those things. And I know he'd be happy to talk with any of you. Um, but yeah, I, it, there are a lot of challenges with VMTs. So that's more of a longer term issue. So really my goal today is just to emphasize the importance of the user pays model. And that as hated as the gas tax is, and tolls are hated too, they are a more neutral approach and an economically efficient approach to taxing, um, to generating revenue for infrastructure than other taxes. Um, so right now, North Carolina's tax is 36.35 cents per gallon. And of course, as you all know, that's pretty high, um, 13th highest in the nation when you look at total tax, state taxes and fees on gasoline. One interesting thing on that though is that the diesel tax is the same rate as the gas tax, whereas there are 20 other states that actually impose higher taxes on diesel. Um, so that's something to consider moving forward just due to the fact, and Ulrich's paper actually outlines exactly how much more wear and tear on the roads is generated from heavier duty vehicles, but they do generate a lot more wear and tear um, per vehicle than our lighter gasoline fueled vehicles. So it is worth considering um, 
asking diesel powered vehicles to pay a little bit more. So that would be something to consider moving forward. Um, and then right now though, so you can see on this map that you already use, um, you generate 89% of your highway spending revenue from gas taxes and vehicle user fees. So that makes sense. You have a pretty high gas tax already, but most of that revenue is being used for infrastructure and you're not having to supplement your dedicated revenue as much as a lot of other states. Now, Tennessee, Idaho, and Hawaii all can completely cover their state highway spending by their gas tax and related user fees. But, um, and so you're getting pretty close there compared to other states that really have to rely on income and sales taxes to supplement that. But um, again, our, our our goal at the Tax Foundation is to look at efficiency of how taxes are structured and levied. And it really does make a lot of sense to stick to that user fees model where those who drive the most are paying the most and paying more for that road use and that wear and tear compared to those who might drive a lot less. So, so the main thing I want to leave you with on transportation taxes um, moving forward, because if you do decide that the gas tax needs to come up a little bit and you're able to transfer some income tax revenue away from highway spending that could free up revenue to either dedicate that general revenue toward other general purposes or to just reduce rates a bit. So some good policy options worth considering. And that's, I know I've talked a while, so I wanna leave you all at that, but um, happy to answer any other questions that may have come up. I, I had a question. You, when we were talking about property taxes, um, you mentioned that property taxes could be improved in the state of North Carolina. Sorry, somebody else has got some noise in the background there. Is that you, Shannon, making all the, <laughs> with the music in the background? <laughs> Oh. Um, so, Catherine, my question was, you said that property taxes could be improved. Um, I mean, everybody I know, I live in a neighborhood where we have a huge amount of people coming in from other states, and they just laugh at our property taxes and go, oh my gosh, I pay, I pay for a year what I paid in a month or a quarter where I used to live. Um, so, can you talk to that a little bit? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So our state business tax climate index, um, that's a really good question. And I'm glad you brought that up because when we look at property tax structure, we are looking at more than just real property taxes. We look at tangible and intangible, tangible property taxes. And so I know one of the things you get kind of dinged for on our index is the fact that there are some intangible property taxes still levied in your state. And actually, I didn't look into that in as much detail. Um, so you probably know more than me kind of the ins and outs of some of those. Um, happy to talk more with the, the my colleague who does the index and kind of calculates your scores on that to see what else are the problem areas. But I know some of the intangible taxes that are still there are a bit of a problem. So even if rates aren't quite as high as a lot of states, um, really, the index is kind of a measure of all the different taxes on property or on wealth or on just the value of assets, if that makes sense. I have a question, Catherine. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, the you talked about the um, program that you put together that kind of gives all the details about the state. Is that on your website or something we could easily access to yes. see that? Yep, absolutely. I can send you our in our state business tax climate index. I think that's what you're asking for. Yeah, I will share with you the index and then my colleague Ulrich's paper on transportation taxes and. And then I can share the North Carolina book we wrote as well. It's outdated because a lot of the reforms have actually been adopted, but um, it talks a lot about the franchise tax and other things that might get into intangible property taxes a bit too and things like that. 
Yeah, I have a question. Um, uh, what about incentives to attract business to states? Uh, North Carolina is the only state in the South that doesn't have an automobile manufacturing plant. And I used to be on the board of the Triad Partnership, and that, that was their big thing was to, to put together a huge track of land that we could use with business incentives to attract an, a car company. And they're still trying to do that. But uh, what, what's your thought on the the amount of money, the, the way that's administered? And um, it seemed like we were always losing out to Tennessee or Georgia. Sure. I'm really glad you asked that question because I know this is – probably not the most popular answer um, when talking to business people, but incentives really from an economic standpoint, they're not a net economic gain for most states. Um, states are offering these and local governments are trying to attract state or businesses across the border all the time with incentives, but all of the economic evidence out there, the research, it's very inconclusive. It's really hard to measure whether they have an effect at all or if that is lasting. And I know, um, I think it was a few years ago when Dell, I think, was lured to North Carolina with incentives and then ended up shutting down that plant a few years later. Um, so they had to pay back those incentives, though. And I'm sorry, what? They had to pay back those incentives. Okay, that's true. Yeah, that's true. But it it creates a bit of revenue uncertainty and volatility there too, if they're paying them back, getting them and then paying them back. So really not a win-win for the state. Um, and a lot of that revenue could be used if there were states like North Carolina that would be willing to continue to kind of reevaluate their incentives. That would free up so much revenue that could be used to get rid of the franchise tax real quick to, um, you know, completely eliminate the corporate income tax potentially. And then um, really the best incentive is a well-structured tax code. So I think one of the problems with competing with Tennessee is individuals want to be there because um, they're going to not have an income tax at all as of next year. Um, so businesses, of course, as you all know, want to be where their employees want to be, where there's a good overall environment, not just for the business, but for their employees too. So complicated there. And I know it's difficult to kind of work on eliminating and kind of cu cutting back some incentives. But I think if North Carolina was willing to take some leadership on that, the state would find that in the long term, it'd be a much better use of money to not pick and choose certain industries over others, but to say, um, you know, everyone gets a good tax code in the state, and it doesn't matter if you're one business or another, whatever you are, like, we want you here in our state. Um, we're going to entice you with this great tax code that is easy to comply with. You don't have to try to figure out all the incentives that you may or may not be eligible for. So we are seeing a lot of states that do have kind of incentive reevaluation processes in place, and it's something... Um, Pew research has actually looked into a lot. So kind of worth uh, seeing some of the research that's out there if you're interested. Okay, thank you. I have a question about the franchise tax fee. Would, are there any uh, elected officials that are pro kind of phasing out that fee that you could, that y'all, do y'all track the individuals that are kind of leaning one way or the other? We don't. We're a completely non-political, non-partisan organization. So we, you know, we work with individuals on kind of all sides of the aisle. Um, and we don't really chat, track what individuals are doing as much, but we do um, just want to focus on kind of continuing to repeal that franchise tax overall. So. But you said there was a bill that was put in place that was vetoed. So we can go back and find that bill and see kind of who authored it. Yes, um, I don't know right offhand. I can find you the bill number though. Um, wanna say, I'll find you the bill number for sure. Um, yeah, it was passed last year, but vetoed. All right. Um, does anyone else have any questions for Catherine? I, know, I hope y'all enjoyed this as much as I did. It was very informative. Um, 
And I think you're somebody we probably have come back again in the future just to give us more updates. Um, so thank you, Catherine. Thank you, guys. Um, um, I have. If you're welcome, if you need to pop off, I know it's okay because I have one quick, um, just kind of an update for the group. So you're welcome to stay on, but um, I'm going to also give everybody your contact information so they can, if they have questions later, they can kind of contact you directly if that's okay. Please do, and I'll send you all the links that you can just give those. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Catherine. So um, just real quick um, for Jim and, and Brian, especially his. We are going to have a, we're not going to have candidates form per se, but we're going to do kind of a meet the candidates and we're going to pre-record interviews with each of our candidates that have, um, that are running for office and have opposition. So we're kind of gathering all that together and we'll release those videos in October so that the community can have a chance to review and listen to what they have to say. Uh, we've been working on questions for those candidates and we finally got those finalized this week and so we're going to try to start recording those next week getting them edited and out within the next couple of weeks so i just want to let you guys know what we've been working on behind the scenes and beth and matthew and mike and tracy have been on that subcommittee to help get that together so thank you guys for that um is there any updates from anyone else in the group Hey Shannon, would you share those questions if I if, if you haven't already, please? Yeah, I'll send them out to everybody if you'd like. Um, today we what we did was we narrowed it to like five for each. We're doing the um, the state, the house, the senate, and the school board and county commissioners are the are the groups that we're we're talking to. Mm -hmm. And uh, the county commissioners, even though they've been elected in our last election. Um, they are still on the ballot in November, and the number of votes will determine how long their seat is at the county commissioner level. So we just thought to determine that was still critical to make sure we had the right folks in the right place for the number of years we needed them to be there. But yes, I will send those questions over to you all in a little bit. Okay. Anything so you're including else? David Parker and Patrick McHenry? McHenry. We didn't do that. We didn't do the federal. We limited it to state, um, house, state, um, senate, county, and um, school board. All right. Anybody we else? We are looking at the local elections, not the council of state elections. Say that again, Mike. When we were looking at who to participate, just because of the sheer volume, we were looking at more of the localized elections rather than the council of state and federal because uh, then it would have gotten too broad we want to keep it more concentrated to the local level we would do all of them if we could <laughs> i think we um agree how important this election is um but yeah i'll send that out to everybody um in a short minute since we just confirmed all the questions Mike, did you have, you saw kind of the back and forth where you find it the last uh, consensus? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, they're all good. Okay. All right. Well, we've narrowed those down. And if you have feedback, let me know as soon as you can so I can, uh, the, the next step was to get those interviews scheduled and get the questions to the candidates so we can get those going. Otherwise, that's sort of it. We'll meet again next month. Um, if y'all have any recommendations for another speaker that you'd like to come in and talk chat with us, just send them my way or feel free to invite them. Just let me know um, if there's topics that we need to be discussing. Um, this would be a great time, especially we could, we probably need to do a, I'd say our next meeting too, we could review our legislative agenda to see if anything's changed. I mean, COVID sort of changed how we've done everything. So we probably wanna look at that again and see if it needs to be adjusted, updated and for 2021. So I think that could be our, probably our plan uh, for next month. And I'll send that in the, to you before the next meeting. I, I think I can get it to you today when I send you the candidates. Sound good? Okay. All right. All right. Well, have a wonderful weekend. Thank you for being on the call today. Enjoy the beach. Yep. Thanks so much. Y'all take Thank care. You. Be safe.
拜。